in a very relevant sense, is the central theme of the Jewish prophecy school. Are the 144,000 only Seventh-day Adventists who are Adventists prior to the Sunday Law crisis? If so, is the number larger at the beginning of the crisis, considering that there will be many martyrs during the crisis? If not, is the number composed of both faithful Adventists who stand and survive the crisis, as well as those that come in under the loud cry? Um, everyone hear that question? Um, I know how I, I answer this question. Is um, the only thing the only thing that I can be certain of. First off, usually it comes up, and it's not in there. It's the hundred forty-four thousand literal or symbolic. So um, I'm going to I'm going to suggest that it's literal. This number is literal. I mean, we could, we might have disagreements on that. Have to battle that through. But use, coming from that point of reference, for me. I only can define the 144,000 as those that have the seal of God when Michael stands up and human probation closes. Amen. When the probation closes, those people that have the seal of God that are alive are the 144,000. The reason I'm saying that is that there is a crisis that precedes Michael standing up that begins at the Sunday Law in the United States. And every country on the globe will have its own Sunday Law crisis, and there's going to come a world Sunday Law, a death decree. Um, so there's a process of time. And those people that are confronted to the Sunday Law in the United States, when it all starts, that receive the seal of God, um, May vary. Some of them, I would. The logic is that we would be among the hundred forty-four thousand, but I don't think there's any evidence that I've seen. And I've had this discussion with people that believed us. I, I haven't seen any evidence that would allow me to say that the people that received the seal of God at the Sunday Law test in the United States all live until the coming of the Lord, even if they have the seal of God. There's going to be many martyrs. I think that the only way the argument that I'm prepared to make is that those that are still standing when human probation closes are the 144,000. And if you and I are faithful and we receive the seal of God at the Sunday law in the United States, there's still the possibility that we're going to be martyrs uh, during the, the loud cry time period when the 11th hour workers are being called out of battle. Um, when I address the distinction between who the 144,000 are in relation to Adventists and non-Adventists. The way that I approach it is I start in the, in the seals. And I start by pointing out that the first four seals parallel the first four churches. It's a repeat and enlarge. Okay? The first seal of the white horse parallels Ephesus. The red horse parallels Smyrna. The black horse parallels Pergamos. The pale horse parallels Thyatira. But the fifth seal doesn't parallel um, Sardis. In fact, the fifth seal isn't a horse, but the first four seals are horses. There's a distinction made just from that point. But Sister White more than once plainly places the fifth seal in Revelation 18. Okay, in the fifth seal, we have the, the martyrs under the altar raising the question, how long until we judge the papacy for persecuting us during the 1206 years? And then the answer comes up, comes back, Rest in your graves till the group of martyrs that dies the way you die is made up. And then um, they're given white robes and they're told to rest for their labor. So when Sister White more than once places the fifth seal and the, the question and answer of the martyrs in the fifth seal in Revelation 18, verses 1 through 5, she's, she's placing that right down there in the Sunday Law crisis when that second group of martyrs will be made up. So, she, she takes the four seals by a tire, the fifth seal, she moves it off to the end of the world. Therefore, um, when it comes to the fifth and sixth and seventh seal, and I, and I hope you understand this concept because this is an important concept in my mind for where we're heading um, on the opening of the seventh seal. The fifth and the sixth and the seventh, the, the fifth, sixth, and seventh seal are not progressive history repeating in large, they're teaching truths. Okay. The fifth seal is teaching the truth about the martyrs. The sixth seal is teaching the truth about Adventism. It begins with the, the signs that introduce the Millerite time period, but it goes all the way to the time period of the wrath of God, which is illustrating the beginning of Adventism and the end of Adventism, and it does so 
partially at least, to raise the question at the end of chapter 6, who shall be able to stand in the day of the Lord's wrath? And then chapter 7 answers that question. Chapter 7 is 144,000, and the great multitude is answering the question that is raised in the sixth seal. So the sixth seal, once again, is a progressive history. It's teaching the truth, and it's, it's teaching the truth about who shall be able to stand. Now, we haven't here, as we usually do, almost always, um, we have a reason in our prophetic studies to deal with the triple applications of prophecy to make some points from that study. We haven't done that here. And where you start when you're teaching the triple application of prophecy is with the three Elijahs. Okay, and I'm going to throw these up here very quickly. I know most of us are probably familiar with it. Um, but a triple application of prophecy is to teach a certain lesson. The first Elijah had to deal with the threefold enemy, uh, an impure woman, Jezebel, who was married to a king, Ahab, and they weren't supposed to be married, and then the prophets of Baal did the dance of deception. The second Elijah, um, John the Baptist, had to deal with the impure woman of Herodias that was not supposed to be married to the king, Herod, and Salome, Herodias' daughter, did the dance of deception. So, Triple application of prophecy, the first time the prophecy is fulfilled, combined with the second time the prophecy is fulfilled, will give you the characteristics of the third time the prophecy is fulfilled. So there's, there's lots in the triple application of prophecy, but these two Elijahs, Elijah and John the Baptist, represent God's people at the end of the world. They have to deal with the, the impure woman, the papacy, the beast, the civil power, the dragon, and the false prophet that does the dance of deception. Um, and there's a lot to say about this. If you're hearing this for the first time, I'm leaving a lot out of this because I'm just trying to make a simple point on this question. God's people at the end of the world, therefore, are made up of two types of people. Elijah never died. Elijah went to heaven in a chariot. He's 144,000. At the end of the world. Right. John the Baptist did die. How did John the Baptist stop? He had his own So he's, he's the mother. Now he's the mother? So when you, when you come to the question in six seal, who's able to stand during the time of God's wrath, and you have in chapter 7 the introduction of 144,000, you also have the identification of the great multitude that no man can number. And you'll notice that the great multitude also has white robes, as do the martyrs in the fifth seal. And in Revelation 20, verse 4, it says this about the martyrs at the end of the world. It says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Christ. Who was beheaded? Oh, John the Baptist who were beheaded for the witness of Christ and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So these are the martyrs during the Sunday law testing time. They didn't receive the mark of the beast, and they were being tested by it. And, and I don't believe that this means that all the martyrs lose their head. This is, this is just certainly the martyrs in a lot of different ways. This is symbolic of, of the martyrs. And this is John, John the Baptist at the end of the world. This is John the Baptist. This is Elijah. Um, and, okay, so getting to one of your questions here. Um, if you add into this, um, this illustration, the judgment of the living, their judgment begins with the house of God. So what we're saying, and this is a very controversial subject, and people get get nervous when I suggest that the lab rain begin to sprinkle on September 11, 2001, it did. You can demonstrate it, so we'll go ahead and suggest it. But the, 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 the further problem with this is if, if the latter rain is truly sprinkling at this time, it means that Acts chapter 3 is being fulfilled, and those people that are receiving the latter rain during this time period are those people that have sent their sins beforehand to judgment, and therefore, Christ is blotting out their sins, yes. and therefore, Christ is judging them, and they are alive. Okay? And therefore, 
We're also saying that the judgment of the living is underway, and judgment begins at the house of God. And so at, when it comes to the Sunday law time period, in the immediate future, judgment is finished in the house of God, and it, and it moves into those 11th hour workers. And therefore, what I'm saying is that the 144,000 are also described as first groups. All right, and in this sense, they're, they're the first that are being judged by this, and it's from that line of reasoning. And, it, and I don't like teaching this because I, I don't know that I'm prepared to argue every aspect of this. This isn't something that I lead out on. But you ask the question, so I'm just, I'll answer it. Um, but I'm open for correction. But I think 144,000 are all Seventh Day Adventists. They're, they're going to have to lift up to a a larger embodiment of truth to be qualified to stand through this time. The, you know, we're, the, what the 11th hour workers, brothers and sisters, are not going to have to learn about the 1843 chart or the 1850 chart. They're just not going to have to. And you can illustrate that, by the way. You can illustrate that. Remember that we're suggesting that this history here of the 144,000 parallels the history of the Millerites, okay? The mighty angel came down on September 11th, but it came down for the Millerites in 1840, right? 1842, you get the 1843 pioneer chart, right? right. And then in August, this is August, eight, 1844, you have the midnight cry. 844, and the midnight cry goes until October 22nd, 1844, right? So for two months you have the midnight cry. So let me ask you a question. Did they use the 1843 pioneer chart during that time period? No. No. They set it aside. Because they had a new light that it was 1844. So they used, in this history, they used this chart until the midnight cry comes and it's been corrected. It's October 22nd, 1844. And for those two months, they're not using that chart. Therefore, in our history, the Lord is using this chart to return us to the foundations of Adventism. To test us by the increase of knowledge. But there's no way that these 11th hour workers in the Sunday law crisis are going to be required to understand the argument in Adventism over the daily or the king of the north. In fact, Sister White has a quote where she says, The only way the world can be warned is by seeing God's people with the seal of God. Their test is to see Christ in his people during this Sunday law testing time. We have a, a higher standard of her. I had a problem with her. Just right. one point, so that uh, you don't get uh, sidelined by what I'll say tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> James White uses the 1843 chart I'll show tomorrow to bring those that he can back to the foundation, which will allow them to see the light of the new chart. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. I don't have a problem with that. But, but they, were, they were using this chart in the middle of our history for evangelism. The Lord's now using this chart for revival within the church, and that's what that's what James White is doing at that point too. He's trying to bring people back to the original platform. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but I I think those people that are alive when human probation closes, then we can say those are the hundred alive and have the seal of God. Those are the hundred and forty-four thousand, and it seems reasonable um, that. There will be seven the rest have you to be been martyred? Yeah, I, I left that out because that's a that's a, a well, hard one to swallow, but well, that is really the fact. The, the rest of you been martyred in the faith, or, 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 or have you been martyred? Yeah. You, so what the, what your question is? You're making a statement, but the question that comes from that is: So, brother Jeff, are you saying that all the eleven power workers are martyrs? That's the, that's part of the question. <laughs> What is uh, perdition? <laughs> perdition? Perdition means destruction. Destruction. It's destruction by what means, time, and place. Well, there's, a, there's a, a perdition that's pointed, up in, pointed out in Bible prophecy, the lake of fire, it's where the beast and the false prophet are cast. Um, at the end of time, and that's perdition. Um, there, I don't know a specific, you know, date, but it's in that sequence of events at the end of time in the seven last. Book. 
do we evaluate the shape of the beast that's given this part descriptive of the model of beast and shape? Repeat the question. How do we evaluate the shape of the beast as given description of the model of the beast and shape? Okay, the, the, the way that, that we identify the mark of the beast is that in Daniel chapter 7, the beasts are kingdoms. Okay, so a beast in Bible prophecy is a king of the start. And the, the beast that is the one that the world is going to be forced to receive its mark is the, the beast, the first beast of Revelation 13, which through the characteristics that are associated with it, we identify as the papacy. It's, it's the beast that ruled the world for 42 months, among other things. So it's the papal beast. So what we do is we, we go through and we see what is the mark of, a, of, the, of authority for the papacy. And the papacy in its own documents identifies that the mark of its authority is the fact that it changed God's law, it changed the seventh-day Sabbath from Sabbath to Sunday, and it claims that as the mark of its authority. So when we're talking about the mark of the beast, we're talking about the mark of papal authority, which is Sunday. And uh, the beast, that's that's the basic answer. I mean, there's, there's much documentation to back it up. That's the logic that we have. Are you not the seventh-day answer? I don't mind it or not. No. Okay. Okay. So I just want to know. Point of reference. Three questions. Okay. What is the true meaning of papalism? True meaning. You mean the definition? Definition. The definition is synonymous with the word heathens. In both words, when you look them up in Funky Wagner or Webster's, it'll tell you that those who are not worshiping. Uh, they're worshiping idols. They're idol worshippers. So they're not worshiping the true God. So that's the definition. That's the definition. But the the essence of there there's two religions in the world. Okay, there's the religion of God and there's the religion of Satan. And Satan's religion comes in a variety of forms. But you determine what Satan's religion is based upon the, the root of Satan's rebellion, which is self exaltation. So the the root of paganism is self-exaltation. Mm -hmm. Both this evil force of the Jews of practice of religious pieces. What makes them evil and what effect does it fall for the church of the office? Church of the office of space in the United States. Well, what was the question? Kind of a broad question. The Pope is an evil force. What makes him evil and what is the implications of his connection with the President of the United States. Um, in Revelation 13, the papacy, of whom the Pope is the representative, receives a deadly wound in 1798. He's taken off the throne of the earth. But in Revelation 13, there's another beast that arises, and that beast comes up out of the earth. And Bible prophecy, the earth means a, in relation to the sea. The sea represents peoples, where the papacy rose was in Europe, where it was many peoples, but the earth beast, the second beast, rises in the United States, which at that time is uninhabited. And it has two horns. The two horn horns of Bible prophecy represents strength. And you don't hold the blame or confuse the president of America because she that isn't the one that she put before the decision of such a moment. Pardon me? I didn't follow that. Uh, I was told that some people are blaming the office of president of the United States. With what is said, the papacy of uh, Pope and Catholic joined together. Yeah, wait, in Revelation 13, let me finish. In Revelation 13, this, this beast that comes up out of the earth, which is the United States, um, in Revelation 12, the papacy persecutes the woman, persecutes the Christian church for 42 months, for 1260 years. So it says the earth opens up its mouth. In Bible prophecy, the, the opening of the mouth is, is identifying the action of the legislative and judicial branches. In 1776, the United States set up the Constitution. It opened its mouth with the, with the identification of religious liberty, and it provided a place of asylum for those Christians that were fleeing from Rome. But in Revelation 13, 11, when it's just identifying this beast, it says that at some point in time, the United States is going to cease to be the land when it's speak as a dragon. 
and it will do the work of placing the papacy back on the throne of the earth. So there comes a point in time where the United States does cease to be a Protestant nation and does do the dirty work of the papacy. And the prophetic evidence is that began in the Ronald Reagan years. Okay, Ronald Reagan claimed to be a Protestant. Have you ever looked up the definition of Protestant? I'm a Protestant. Yeah, but if you look it up either in a Catholic dictionary or a, a Protestant dictionary, there's only one definition of Protestant that needs to protest Rome. Mm -hmm. And in the Ronald Reagan years, Ronald Reagan formed a secret alliance with mm -hmm. the papacy. And the reason that Protestants protested Rome is because they believed that the Pope of Rome was the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. So when Ronald Reagan formed a secret alliance with the Antichrist of Bible prophecy, he ceased to be a Protestant because you cannot protest Rome if you're in bed with Rome. Okay. So Jezebel, is there an, is there an incoming to the... Yeah we'll, uh, yeah, we'll have to take these questions and answers up tomorrow um, because of time. I'm not bring trying back to... Home. Pardon me? Oh, I just want to bring back. Yeah. They are to me too. All this is covering that 2004 prophecy. Yeah. Well, I don't know if all of it is, but some of it is. Brother Jamal, would you have a closing prayer for us? Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to investigate your scripture. Thank you for the guidance of your spirit. We thank you, Lord God, for the zeal and the wonderful understanding of everyone here. We ask you, Lord, that you continue to help and push us forward, dear Lord, in our knowledge of the truth, and that you bring us as we've been born into the experience that's populated through that page, the sacred page. Thank you, dear Lord, and as we pray for the lunch, we pray a blessing upon food, the mouths of our to eat it, and as it prepares. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.